Hi, I'm Charles with Annie Cap. The story begins in a world where demi-humans are slaves to humans. Our protagonist Banaza is nice to the demi-humans, but he is hated by the humans because of it. Even the demi-humans warn him about being kind to them, but Banaza insists. Banaza wishes everyone could just get along, but not many feel the same way. Just then, Banaza gets summoned to another world, where he is told that he is a hero candidate. He is now in the magical kingdom of Clyrode, but they're in the middle of a prolonged battle against the Dark Army. The kingdom has been summoning potential heroes from other worlds in the hopes that they will fight the Dark Army for them. The first course of action is to assess Benaz's abilities. In exchange for returning to level 1 after being summoned to their world, candidates receive divine blessings from their gods. These are powers that no ordinary person can acquire simply by training. It is called Divine Revelation. Benaza is able to read their language, but everyone is horrified when the display shows that Benaza did not receive divine revelation. His stats are simply that of an ordinary person. This is incredibly disappointing, and the summoners deem this a failure. Benaza tried to tell them that he's just an ordinary merchant, so now he asks that they simply send him home. Just then, everyone is in awe of a different candidate, as they state that someone has appeared who possesses powers worthy of the legendary hero. Everyone runs to this guy, as all his stats are level 999. They deem him their savior, and they beg that he fight for them. Banaza would just like to go home, but his words go unheard. He tries to think of a way to have them send him home, but the king is busy declaring that the blonde guy will be their hero. Sometime later, Banaza gets tossed into a carriage and taken away. A look back to just a moment ago shows the king telling Banaza that his summoning gate closed and they can't send him home. The kingdom acknowledges that it's their fault, so they will compensate. Instead of simply getting rid of him, they will allow him to live in the Delaveza forest in the north, where he can live out the rest of his useless life. The only condition is that he not tell anyone about the mistake they made. On the way there, Banaz's escort explains that he's not allowed to speak to him. Banaz is very nice though, and he's able to get the guy to talk. He reveals that in this country, it doesn't matter if you're a human or a demi-human, they're all treated equally. Benaza thinks about how things weren't looking so good at first. He has the worst stats, he's being forced to live in the forest, and there's some dark army threatening humanity. However, Benaza won't be looked down upon anymore, so he begins to think that this world might not be so bad. It takes 20 whole days for them to reach the forest. When they do, Benaza's given a bottomless bag that has enough money and food to last him for a while. The driver warns that the dark army lurks around in this forest, so if he wants to live, then he encourages Banaza to get away from there as fast as possible. When alone, Banaza takes a sword from his inventory and notices some slime nearby. They look similar to the ones from his old world, so he assumes that they won't attack him. He is very wrong though, so Banaza must defend himself. He manages to survive the encounter, but his cheap weapon has already begun to fall apart. Just then, a notification reveals that he just reached level 2. His stats look different from before, but Banaza is confused by the strange symbol that has replaced the numbers. Banaza turns on voice notifications, so the voice tells him that he has acquired some magic spells. He will be able to activate them without opening any windows, and Banaza is shocked by all the spells he acquired. Just then, an alert reveals that a monster lure spell was placed on the bottomless bag he was given. This monster lure is definitely why the slime attacked him. Also, considering that the weapon he was given was practically useless, Banaza determines that the kingdom was setting him up to die. The voice would like to know if he wants to remove the lure spell, so he does and Banaza wonders why they would use magic that's so easy to get rid of. Banaza goes to look for a safe spot to take shelter, but the notification stops him. It reveals that the forest has a very high concentration of milesium. It's a generic term for liquids or gases emitted by demons. It causes serious harm to humans, so the voice would like to know if he wants to purify the forest. Our unassuming protagonist thinks it's a good idea if that's something the system can do, especially if he will have to live in the forest. The system explains that it will consume one third of his magic, but Banaza figures that he is so powerless that it doesn't matter. Banaza is shocked though when the purification spell activates, and it ends up being a grand display of magic. Just then, the notifications go crazy as Banaza levels up several times. Back at the castle, the princess points out how terrible it was to send Banaza to the forest, especially since everything was all their fault. The worst part about it is that the Dark Army set up their front lines in the Delaveza forest. 
The king couldn't care less, as he just calls Banaza a useless piece of trash, unfit to be their hero. Just then, the king is urgently told that someone just used the highest holy magic of all, purification. The king is amazed that the golden-haired hero was able to acquire such high-level holy magic already, but he is shocked when he is told that it was not him. The golden-haired hero has headed south, but the purification spell was used in the forest to the north. Back with our boy Banaza, he finds that he has leveled up all the way to level 367. He didn't even eliminate any monsters, so Banaza determines that in this world, you can level up just by using magic. What's even more confusing to him is that the strange symbol is still showing up next to his stats. This is all a lot to take in, so Banaza decides to hide the level up notifications. Banaza checks to see how much magic he has left, and he is surprised to see that it's been fully restored in just seconds. Instead of thinking he has some amazing ability, Banaza assumes that his magic capacity is just terrible. He worries that he might still be in danger, as he assumes that his magic is so weak that it probably didn't purify the forest that well. Banaza is banned from living in the town, so the system recommends that he use shapeshifting magic. This would allow him to go unnoticed, so Banaza gives it a try. He tries out changing gender, but regrets it pretty quickly and changes to something better suited for him. The system then recommends that he use teleportation magic, so he teleports into the city. In his old world, teleportation was a spell that only really powerful sorcerers could use, so Banaza assumes that this world is different, and everyone can use it here. The clever Banaza tries to teleport himself to his old world, but it doesn't work. He then looks for a guild so he can make some money. Registering as a merchant might be difficult since he is so new, so he hopes to find an adventurer's guild. That way, he can do some monster hunting or transport quests. Luckily, his system gives him directions to the guild. When there, it is explained that adventurers are assigned ranks based on their accomplishments. They can earn better rewards and accept tougher quests as their rank rises. It's pretty much the same as guilds in his old world, so Banaza decides to register. He can't give his real name though, so he goes with Fleo instead. Fleo wants to make money quickly, but he is too low of a rank to earn very much. Just then, Fleo overhears a girl in need of someone that can escort her to the De La Veza forest. Unfortunately, she doesn't have much money to offer. Even worse, it is rumored that the Dark Army has its frontline base in that forest. No one is willing to take her, but she is desperate to help her family that lives near there. Some adventurers shove her aside when they become annoyed, so Fleo offers to take her. She explains that she doesn't have much to offer, but Fleo says it's not a big deal since he has been there before and he can just teleport them there. Everyone is absolutely shocked to hear him say that he can use teleportation magic, but they don't believe he can use such a rare ability and they just think he is lying. The clueless Fleo is surprised that it's not a beginner spell, especially since it didn't even use that much of his mana. Just then, one of the royal knights named Valerosa demands that he get away from the girl. She declares that Fleo doesn't look like a skilled enough sorcerer to use such an advanced spell, so she is suspicious of him. Her group is just as skeptical, and they all accuse him of planning to do something devious. Fleo realizes that he can't afford to cause any suspicion, so he offers to take them all with them. They go somewhere hidden so he can use teleportation, but Bellarosa warns him not to try anything funny. Fleo instantly teleports them, and they are shocked. Teleportation alone is already unbelievable, but he was able to take them really far away. They wonder if he's a great sorcerer of the highest order, but Fleo just tells them that he's a rookie adventurer who can use a bit of magic. They all apologize for treating him so poorly, but he's just glad that they aren't suspicious of him anymore. Just then, the young girl notices that the forest isn't covered by a thick layer of Melisium anymore. Fleo prepares to tell her what he did, but his system warns that it's dangerous to inform a demon about him using purification magic. Fleo is confused by the mention of a demon, but Bellarosa and her group aim their weapons at the little girl. The guild has been suspicious of her, so Bellarosa demands that she show them her true form. The little girl acts terrified at first, but soon she shocks everyone when she reveals her true self. Her name is Fenris, younger sister of Fengrel of the Infernal Four. She releases enough Melisium to bring all the girls to their knees, and Bellarosa is shocked as she wasn't expecting the girl to be a demon related to the Infernal Four. Fenris is impressed to see that Fleo is unaffected by Melisium, so she decides to leave him for last. Fleo manages to save Bellarosa, but knows that he won't be able to run away himself while still protecting the four girls. 
Fleo commands his ability to teleport all the girls away, and he impresses himself when it actually works. Fleo doesn't know why he was chosen to come here, but he refuses to be eliminated before he gets to do anything in this new world. Fleo decides to stand up and fight, so he prepares to try out every single spell he has. Fenris tries to stop him, but it's no use, as Fleo uses a spell called Meteoric Leap to launch himself into the sky. Fleo surprises himself with how skillful that was, and uses another ability to defend himself. Fenri shows that she is skillful herself, as she changes location to escape Fleo's whirlwind, but Fleo uses a gravitational spell to stop her from moving. Fenris is stunned at how powerful he is, and Fleo desperately searches through all his spells to find one that will restrain her. His system recommends that he use subjugation magic. It enslaves his target, allowing Fleo to control their thoughts and actions. Fleo refuses to use magic like that, but time is running out as Fenris is about to break free. She keeps trying to use spells, but Fleo's system keeps negating them. It's only a matter of time before she breaks loose, so the system once again recommends that he use subjugation magic. It keeps telling him to do it, so Fleo keeps refusing, because he just came to this world and he doesn't want to bring that kind of corruption from his previous world. Just then, Fenris concedes that she doesn't have the magic to break free, and just tells Fleo to end her life. Fleo refuses to do it as he explains that he doesn't even like fighting in the first place. Fenris is shocked when he frees her, so she points out that she is a warrior of the demons who does battle with humans. Fleo explains that he doesn't care if someone is human or demon, he just doesn't like eliminating someone that has already surrendered. Fenris is shocked by his kindness, and she undoes her beast transformation to revert back into a human. Fleo offers to let her go, but he wants her to promise that she won't hurt any more humans. He checks his bottomless bag for some clothes for her, but her magic is depleted and she falls asleep. That night, Fleo looks at all the different types of magic he has. He thinks about how people were in disbelief to hear that he could teleport, and Fleo wonders why he has such powerful magic. Fenris wakes up and wonders how she could have lost, even though she is resistant to magic. She realizes that Fleo healed her while she was sleeping, and points out that other people would have eliminated her and skinned her. Fleo didn't, so she promises never to fight humans ever again. Furthermore, Fleo demonstrated such immense power that she has decided to acknowledge him as her master. She vows to dedicate her life to repaying him, but Fleo says it's okay. She doesn't back down, and even offers to willingly be his slave. Fleo refuses to own any slaves, but she determines that if she can't serve him, then there's nothing left to live for. Fleo stops her and gives in, allowing her to follow him. Later, Fleo tells her everything about how he was summoned, and failed to be a hero candidate because he had no skills. Fleo shows her what he really looks like, and explains that he doesn't know what to do next. He is sure that she will regret following him, but she explains that her race lives solely for the one they recognize as their master. No matter who he is or where he is from, she swears to always be loyal to him. Fleo once again agrees to let her stay by his side, and she could not be any happier. At the castle, the king is disappointed to hear that the golden hero just let the troops he was in charge of get eliminated. This hero blames the soldiers for panicking, and he explains that he did all he could to save them. He leaves, but another soldier tells the king that the hero just sat behind the army the entire time. Then he ran away while everyone else fought, and he blamed everyone for losing. It looked pretty bad, so some of the troops have started to dislike the hero. When he is alone, the hero is furious that none of his abilities have improved at all, even after an entire month of training. He can hold his own against weak monsters, but he is helpless against any beast with any kind of fighting ability. Just then, the hero's servant named Tsuya arrives to greet him. This guy is a real piece of work, as he tells her to come with him, so he can indulge her in every luxury with the castle's money. The next day, Fleo decides to go to the Adventurer's Guild to make some money, but he still can't get used to Fenris calling him master. Some merchant mistakes them for a married couple, so Fleo thinks it might make it easier to travel together without looking suspicious if they act like they are a couple. Fenris happily agrees to be his wife, since it's a Lupin's dream to have a strong husband. Fleo tries to remind her that they will just be pretending, but it's too late as she is already calling him darling. At the Adventurer's Guild, Fenris gets her own Adventurer's Tag. Having matching accessories with Fleo reminds Fenris of something. Her race called Lupins perform a marriage ritual, in which a mated pair swallows the bones of a prey that they hunted together. 
Luckily for our boy, this thought is interrupted when the guild receptionist asks for Fenri's name. Fenris calls out to the human woman as she proudly prepares to say her real name, but Fleo interrupts her and registers her under the name Rees. Afterwards, Fleo explains that he needs her to live as a human from now on, so she needs to get used to using fake names. Just then, it is announced that the guild has an urgent quest to stop some psycho bears from entering the city. All the adventurers are terrified since the psycho bears are the ones that destroyed the hero's army. It's an emergency, so adventurers of any rank are eligible to take the job. To encourage someone to take it, the guild will pay out 10 times the normal amount per bear. The job is clearly very profitable, but Fleo doubts he can handle it. Reese insists that he can, but Fleo points out that the real hero even failed to defeat them. Reese then comes up with an idea. She will defeat the psycho bears herself, and this will prove how strong Fleo is since he was the one that defeated her. Fleo teleports them to the forest where they will find the bears, and there's a vacant house there that the guild told them they can use as a base. Reese is sure that she can handle the battle on her own, but Fleo refuses to let her. Besides that, he also has some spells he wants to test, so Reese is just glad that they will be together. Just then, they hear screaming and find the group of knights from before surrounded by psycho bears. Reese remembers them well and just wants to ignore the pathetic weaklings. The buff girl is in bad shape, but she still tries to fight. She only ends up in a bad spot, but luckily for the knights, the psycho bears are struck down by an attack. One dangerous bear remains, but it is defeated by Reese. It was Fleo's idea to save them, so Reese thinks that he's just too nice. The knights are all grateful and they explain that they were worried about what might have happened to Fleo. Fleo fears that they might find out Reese's true identity, so he just introduces her as his travel companion. She wishes he would introduce her as his wife, but they are interrupted by another psycho bear. The bear goes right for Reese, but she knocks the thing out with just one terrifying glare. Reese acts like she doesn't know what happened, and the bear nods its head when they assume that it has surrendered. They decide to take it as a pet, but this just shocks the knights since these psycho bears were ferocious enough to defeat the hero's army. Reese says that's even more of a reason to take it as their pet, but Fleo likes the thought of keeping it from hurting others. Fleo puts a collar on it that will prevent it from going wild, and he uses shapeshift on it to change it into something that doesn't stand out as much. They try to think of a name for it, but the knights can't believe how casually they just tamed such a ferocious beast. Afterwards, the knights thank Fleo for saving them yet again, and they introduce themselves. Aside from Bellarosa, there is Blossom the Heavy Fighter, Bellano the Witch, and the ex-farmer named Beliri. The knights reveal that they want Fleo to teach them how to fight. The golden hero was furious when his army failed him, so he declared that he would never lead another force against the Dark One. The only way he would reconsider is if he found people he could trust to serve him. The golden hero has locked himself in his room till this time comes, so the king issued an order to all the knights. They are to dedicate themselves to combat until they can eliminate beasts on the psycho bear's level. The four of them can't even defeat one psycho bear together, so they need Fleo's help. Fleo thinks about how he doesn't even know how magic works at all, so there's no chance that he will be able to teach anyone. Reese has her mind on something else though, as she is super jealous of the girls trying to get close to Fleo. Fleo decides to tell them that Reese is his wife, and he's just trying to live a quiet and peaceful life with her. The knights back off as they understand, but Reese is then the one to suggest that Fleo help them. She points out that as his wife, she knows better than anyone that he is a kind man that can't abandon someone in need. Fleo knows that he can't really teach what he doesn't know, but he can tell that they really need his help. He explains that he might not be a great teacher, but he does agree to train them. The girls are overjoyed, but they have one more request. They need a place to stay and would even be willing to pay rent for the corner of the living room. Reese thinks it's a fantastic idea since there are plenty of rooms, and she and Fleo can share a bed since they are married. Elsewhere, it is reported to the Dark One that the one who eliminated the demons and purified the Delaveza forest was not part of the kingdom of Clyrode. It was a lone individual. The Dark One is surprised to hear that one person has powerful enough magic to eliminate demons instantly. He has made his decision and instructs his subordinate to find and capture this individual at all costs. Sometime later, Fleo is shocked to wake up with Reese by his side as she wakes up her darling. Fleo has no clue what she is doing there, so Reese reminds him that they are married. A look to the night before shows Reese telling Fleo that she was prepared to offer her body and soul to him. Fleo told her to calm down, so she wondered if he hated her now. 
He explained that he needed time to mentally prepare and decided to just sleep in the hallway. Reese pointed out that that would just make the other girls suspicious of their relationship, so he had no other choice but to sleep in the room. Reese now forces him to change clothes, and Belarosa gets real embarrassed when she walks in on them. They were in a pretty compromising situation, so it's pretty likely that she got the wrong idea. Later, Belarosa confidently faces off against a giant boar. This thing is terrifying though, so she runs, and it even scares Blossom. Reese instructs Bellano to protect the others with defensive magic, and Bellary follows it up with a useless arrow. Bellano feels sick after running out of magic, so the group of girls run for their lives. Fleo watches and realizes that leading their combat training is going to be a lot more work than he thought. Afterwards, Fleo shows the girls their room. He received payment for completing the Psycho Bear job, so he used the money to get them the room. Fleo figures he will be training them for a while, so he couldn't just make them sleep on the floor. Just then, Reese reveals that she cooked for everyone, but Fleo was horrified because she just made raw meat. She made enough for everyone to celebrate their new home, but Fleo explains that they prefer their meat cooked. Fleo and Bellarosa take care of the cooking, but Saib agrees with Reese that fresh meat is better served raw. When the food's ready, all the girls wonder if Fleo used magic to make it, since it looks so good, but he credits Bellarosa for helping him. She admits to being better at cooking than swordsmanship, and reveals that her family was poor growing up, so they had to cook their own meals. Everyone thinks the food is delicious, but Reese exclaims that leaves are only food for weak monsters that are not able to hunt meat. Fleo made the salads though, so Reese vows to eat anything her darling has prepared, even if it's leaves. Surprisingly, she actually likes the salad, but what's more shocking is that she really liked the cooked meat. She is stunned to hear that Bellarosa cooked the meat, but she doesn't want to be outdone, so Reese promises to do the cooking next time. When they return to the guild, everyone is amazed that their group keeps coming back with more boars every time. Reese would like to go for a walk while their catch is assessed, but she rejects Fleo's offer to come along. This works out fine though as Leolith of the Adventurers Guild wants to speak with Fleo. It turns out that Reese didn't want him to go with her, since she is planning something special. Leolith explains to Fleo that his exploits are the talk of the guild. People around town are even talking about him, so Fleo realizes that he might be overdoing things. Leolith explains that a request has been made for Fleo to lend his strength and service to the hero. If Fleo agrees, the king will make him an honorary knight. They have never seen anyone who could take down so many A-rank magic beasts at once, especially with only two people. Leolith would rather keep Fleo in his guild, but he can't deny him this opportunity to help the world. Fleo determines that in this world, this is probably the greatest honor anyone could receive. Fleo isn't from this world though, and he has no reason to fight the demons. Leolith is then stunned when Fleo rejects the offer. Outside, Fleo finds Reese in really bad shape, and he wonders if she was attacked by a monster. It wasn't anything dangerous like that, as Reese thinks about how she had no idea this thing called cooking would be so difficult. We then see that she went on her own to take cooking lessons, where the instructor explained that cooking is the way to a man's heart. The cooking process was way too slow for her, but her impatient attempt at using magic just messed things up. Reese is determined to win Fleo's heart though, so she vows to conquer cooking. Elsewhere, the golden hero hears about an adventurer who is eliminating a crazy number of magic beasts with just one other person helping. This could be the person that will give him the confidence to resume the battle against the Dark One. The hero orders that this adventurer be brought to him right away so that he can put him to work as his right hand man. One month later, we see that Fleo has had to reject the king's offer several times already. Reese offers to threaten them to never come back, but Fleo would rather they go train. They find Blossom and Saib hard at work on the farm, but Fleo wishes she would put this much effort into her training. Later, Reese tries to get Beleri to hit a target on a tree, but she has a hard time doing it because she feels bad for the cute tree. Reese tries to entice her to shoot a crazy-eyed bird for its delicious meat, but she can't do that either. Fleo then gives Beleri a magic ring he made that will increase her magic capacity. When he leaves, Beleri considers putting it on her ring finger, but Reese threatens her not to. Just then, Belarosa gets caught in a tough spot, so she calls out to Fleo, but Reese rescues her instead. Reese sees right through her little act and points out that she's pretending to be weak to appeal to her husband. Later, Reese feeds everyone and they are amazed by her cooking. She reveals that she has been going to cooking classes every time Fleo went to the guild. 
Reese explains that she only used to care about her strength, but she has learned to do more things now, and they make her even happier than just getting stronger. Reese made some curry just for Fleo, because her teacher said it's the key to a man's heart. Fleo loves it, so Reese couldn't be more excited. However, outside someone watches them, and is shocked to find that Reese is with humans. Reese was once feared as the Dark Army's bravest woman warrior, so the girl wonders if she has betrayed them. Just then, Reese appears to confront this demon named Eulaminus. Eulaminus explains that she was just surveying the area, but she is stunned when Reese reveals that she is married. Reese gets upset when she wonders if Eulaminus is there to get between her and her husband, but Eulaminus denies these allegations. Eulaminus then thinks about how Reese is a completely different person now compared to when she was in the Dark Army. She can't even believe that this guy is calm when a demon is right next to him. What's most confusing though, is that when she uses her ability assessment magic, she gets no reading on Fleo's levels at all. This has never happened before, as her readings have never failed, even when used on the Dark One. Just then, Ulumina is shocked to learn that Fleo was the one that used purification magic on the forest. She is really upset, and points out that Fleo eliminated Reese's brother Fengrel and his entire unit. Fangirl was stationed in the forest, and they haven't heard anything from him since the purification. Reese surprisingly already knew all this, but she explains that her brother would hate it if she pitied his death. Even more than that, he was one of the Dark One's Infernal Four, so his incompetence was his own fault. Reese then explains that she was charmed by Fleo's power. That is why she chose him as her husband, and nothing can change that. Just then, the other girls reveal that they were listening, and they can't believe that Reese is the infamous Fenris. Eulamina realizes that Fleo was a serious threat to the Dark Army because he was able to turn Fenris into their enemy. Eulamina explains that she is intrigued by this charming power Fleo has, so she insists that they have a mock battle. In reality though, Eulamina is planning to eliminate them both. Reese interjects by pointing out that Eulamina is just trying to get close to Fleo, but they agree to the mock battle anyway. The battle begins with Eulamina using a magic attack. It's a distraction though, so she can use several spells from underneath Fleo and Reese. Just then, Eulaminus is shocked when Fleo uses a forced cancellation spell to get rid of all her attacks. Fleo captures her and reminds her that he is her opponent. He realized what she was doing and explains that he won't allow her to target Reese. Fleo is just too powerful, so Eulaminus surrenders. Later, Fleo apologizes for hiding who Reese was, but he is stunned when the girls decide not to report this to the kingdom. They explain that Reese has helped them greatly with their training, and they would never betray someone so kind. Just then, Eulaminus returns with the Dark Army's most elite force, the Legion of Dragons. The girls are terrified because this legion has wiped out entire human forces many times. Eulaminus prepares to hear them surrender, but she can't believe her ears when Fleo is just excited to see dragons for the first time. Dragons existed in his old world, but he never had a chance to see them. Eulaminus furiously declares that it's time to attack, but Fleo uses impressive holy magic to strike down a bunch of dragons. Eulaminus can't believe that the Dark Army's strongest dragons were wiped out in an instant, so she retreats. Blossom wishes she would have fought with some of her gardening tools, so Fleo tells her to try throwing it. She does, so Fleo uses some augmentation magic on it. He sharpens it and accelerates it, so it absolutely wrecks a dragon. Blossom is amazed to see that she earned the Dragon Slayer title, so all the girls want Fleo to help them do the same. Unfortunately, the dragons have gotten away, so Bellarosa sobs in defeat. Elsewhere, the Dark One can't believe that a mere adventurer could use such powerful magic. He is not even a hero, so the Dark One declares that it's time for them to make their next move. A while later, Fleo puts up a barrier around the house so they can detect when demons are coming. Reese gets upset just thinking about the annoying cat, so Fleo must tell her to calm down. Reese gets even more upset as she thinks he's defending her, but Fleo just remembers how she said that he was responsible for eliminating Reese's brother and all his troops. It's clearly bothering him, but he just tells Reese that it's nothing. Nearby, Blossom can't stop staring at her screen, as she is in disbelief to have earned the Dragon Slayer title. The girls admire the hoe that destroyed the dragon, but Bellarosa says it's time to hunt for today's share of magic beasts. Their admiration is then directed at her for being disciplined enough to train every day. The girls have a lot of gratitude towards Fleo for helping them, so they are eager to get stronger as well. 
While they all admire Bellarosa, we see that she's actually in tears. Receiving the Dragon Slayer title is every up and coming adventurer's dream, so she is depressed about falling behind. If she had received the title instead, she could have gotten back the noble status that her family lost. Then they might have been able to live in the capital again, just like when her father was a knight. Just then some guy appears looking for a friend of his. Bellarosa is skeptical of this guy since he is so lightly equipped in a forest full of magic beasts. He explains that he is looking for Fleo's wife, but this makes it clear to Bellarosa that he must be part of the Dark Army. She demands to know what business he has with someone that cut ties with the Dark Army, and depending on his answer, they might have to do battle. The guy admits to being part of the Dark Army, but he explains that he is only there to check on Fenris. He decides to leave but asks that Fenris be given a message. If she ever wants to chat about the past, then he is available. Before leaving, he reveals that his name is Gozal. Fleo and Reese arrive, so Bellarosa tells them everything. Reese knows exactly who the guy was and can't believe that he picked such an obviously fake name. Fleo explains that they came because his barrier detected a demon. Bellarosa is then shocked to hear that his display screen said that the person she was talking to was actually the Dark Lord. Reese confirms this as she explains that his real name is Gol. Bellarosa now trembles in fear after hearing this. She raised her sword to the Dark Lord, so she is certain that the demons will want to eliminate her. The next day, Gozal is invited into their home, and he's shocked by how calm Fleo is in his presence. Gozal being there is new to Bellarosa, so she is terrified to see him. Gozal then reveals that his visit has to do with Eulaminus. Bellarosa is part of this meeting as well, but she has no clue why. She is terrified and can't understand why she has to sit next to the Dark Lord. Reese assumes that the Dark Lord is there to get revenge, but he shockingly reveals that he actually came to ask Fleo to join the Dark Army. Fleo calmly declines, which is something Gozal didn't expect. Fleo lives in the forest, so Gozal assumed that he wanted to oppose the humans. This isn't the case, as Fleo just doesn't think it makes sense for him to side with the humans just because he is one. On top of that, Fleo for some reason just openly tells the Dark Lord that he isn't from this world, and doesn't even know why the humans and demons are at war. Rees never explained it to him because Fleo simply doesn't want to fight. Gozal admits that it's unlikely that anyone exists who knows the true reason they fight. The war has been going on for 500 years, and it started around the time the first Dark One ascended. The first Dark Lord came from another world to take over this one, and he was accepted by demons who at the time were being oppressed by humans. Stopping a war that has gone on this long won't be easy, but the ideals passed down through 12 generations of Dark Ones has changed. Gozal is the current Dark Lord, but has no interest in ruling the world. However, just then, Gozal releases a ton of power. He declares that he is still king of the demons, and he cannot allow someone who possesses such a threat to the demons to fall into the hands of the humans. Gozal warns Fleo that he must take his advice and join the Dark Army. Fleo calmly explains that Gozal has seriously overestimated his abilities. Besides that, he does not intend to pick a side in the war. Gozal stops releasing power and is actually amused to see how determined Fleo is. He is impressed and points out that this must have been the same determination that led Fleo to rejecting the king. Gozal prepares to leave, but assures them that this does not mean he has given up. Gozal thinks about how unbelievable it is to find a human so unfazed by his presence. He isn't just talking about Fleo either, he's talking about Bellarosa. The other girls arrive to wonder if she is okay, but she is frozen from shock. When she wakes up the next morning, Bellarosa is shocked to see that Gozal is there again. He's eating the breakfast that Reese made, so Reese just asks him to leave as soon as he is done. He insists that Bellarosa join him, but she goes to get dressed instead. Later, Bellarosa tries to sneak away, but Gozal finds her. He would like to speak with her, but she runs off to training. Day after day, Gozal keeps returning to the house, and Bellarosa keeps coming up with excuses to leave. Gozal doesn't seem to take the hint though, and just admires how hard of a worker she is. At the castle, the king is informed that a mysterious demon has been visiting Fleo frequently. The king becomes furious since Fleo has been ignoring his summons, and now seems to be siding with the Dark Army. He plans to send soldiers to capture Fleo, but the princess tells him not to. If he's wrong about Fleo, then his actions might drive him to the Dark Army. She thinks they should listen to what Fleo has to say, and come up with a compromise. The king silences her, and the golden hero arrives to agree with him. He asks to be given soldiers so he can force Fleo to obey their orders. 
At the demon's castle, Yulamina warns Gozal that going to Fleo's house so many times alone could be dangerous. Gozal points out that he trusts Fleo much more than he does the human king. If there is a chance that he can get someone as powerful as Fleo on his side, then he vows to do his best to convince him. Yulamina points out that their soldiers are awaiting his orders, but Gozal has not made his decision yet on when they will make their move. When he leaves, Yulamina is concerned because some demons have begun to speak ill of the Dark One for visiting Fleo so much. She wonders if Gozal is really going there so much just for Fleo. Back home, Fleo explains that he has been thinking about selling gear made of dragon scales, and he has already made a prototype. It will take some more work before it's ready for sale, but Fleo is determined to make this a successful business so they can support themselves. Reese wonders if he's making the right decision by refusing to work for the king, since he would be making a lot more money that way. On top of that, he would be using his abilities to the fullest. She wonders if he doesn't want to fight the demons because of her, but Fleo points out that he isn't as kind as she thinks he is. What's really holding him back is that after finding out that he has such incredible power, he would rather not fight anyone if he doesn't have to. Reese points out that that is being kind, and it's one of the things she admires about him. Just then, Fleo was told that someone has arrived. It's the golden-haired hero, and Fleo has to tell Reese not to kick him to the curb. This guy gives Fleo two options. Either Fleo becomes his subordinate, or he will be considered an informant to the Dark Army, in which case the hero will have to cut him down this very moment. The hero is pleased with his little speech, and considers this to be one of his top three best climax scenes of his entire life. He assumes that Fleo is so in awe of his aura that he's unable to speak, and he doesn't blame him as the hero is sure that he will become a legend of this world. All he will have to do is defeat the Dark Lord with Fleo as his subordinate. Fleo apologizes seeing as the hero brought so many people to his house, but he explains that he will not be choosing a side in the war no matter what. The hero deems him a traitor, but the girls point out that this is tyrannical behavior. The hero threatens them with treason for helping Fleo, and only offers to let them be free if they help him convince Fleo. Fleo gets really serious as he determines that he has no other option. He refuses to choose a side, but he doesn't want to fight here so they will have to go somewhere else. The hero is shocked, but Reese is totally fine with leaving. The other girls wish to go with them as well, because living with them has taught them that fighting demons might not be the right thing to do. All the girls feel the same way, but the hero points out that there's no possible way they could escape this encirclement of soldiers. The hero tries to put Fleo in his place, but he is shocked when Fleo uses a teleportation spell. Once the spell is over, everyone is absolutely stunned to see that they disappeared. It's not just them though, as Fleo somehow managed to teleport the house and fields as well. Everyone is utterly shocked, as they can't believe that Fleo could use teleportation on such an insane scale. Just then, they notice that the demon that has been visiting Fleo has appeared, so the hero orders that he be captured. Gozal sees that everything is gone, so he becomes furious and blames the humans. His rage is overwhelming, and he declares that he must teach the humans a lesson. In his fury, Gozal issues an order for all his demon forces to assemble and launch an all-out attack on the kingdom of Clyrode. This is exactly what Yulamina was waiting for, and she tells all the demons to mobilize. The human soldiers see that darkness is approaching, so the golden hero runs for his life. Elsewhere, all the girls are amazed by Fleo's teleportation, as everything is just how it was before. However, Fleo explains that they are now near a town west of the royal capital. They are pretty far from the capital now, so the girls are glad that neither the hero nor the Dark One will be able to find them. No one is more relieved than Bellarosa, since the Dark One seemed to be really into her. Fleo apologizes for putting Reese through all of this, but she's just happy as long as she gets to stay by Fleo's side. Reese declares that she will make a feast to celebrate their new home, so everyone rushes inside. A while later, it is reported to the king that the demons are tearing through their defenses, and their magic barrier in the northern stronghold won't last much longer. The king becomes furious as he wonders what the golden hero is doing. The so-called hero has once again locked himself up in the southern stronghold, so the king summons him. He is told that they must assemble all the mages in the kingdom to cast purification, but the king points out that this comes with serious ramifications. Time is running out though, and they can't depend on the hero, so they need the king to make a decision. Elsewhere, the Dark Lord issues an order to withdraw his troops. 
Illuminus points out that this would be the perfect time to press their advantage, but the Dark Lord predicts that the humans will soon use purification and they can't let their troops come into contact with it. We see that the Dark Lord is correct as the king and several mages cast a purification spell. Back with our hero, he arrives home to find that Reese is acting even more friendly than normal. Fleo was out looking for shops to sell his gear to and doing research on how much armor sells for. Beleri has been thinking about raising horses so she can rent them out to pool carts. She believes it could be a dependable source of income and she wants to contribute to the household budget. Blossom thinks the same thing and plans to sell the vegetables from the garden. Bellarosa and Bellano feel bad for having no talent and therefore no income, but Reese tells them not to worry. She declares that taking care of the pack is the job of the pack leader's wife, but Bellarosa isn't sure how she feels about being part of a pack. Fleo also tells them not to worry, as the two of them can just focus on improving their combat skills. Back at the castle, we learn that the Dark Army has retreated because of the purification. The magic will last for three months, and the Dark Army's forces won't be able to go near the purified land until then. The problem is that many of their mages are comatose after having depleted their magic. The king is one of them, so the princess declares that she will carry out his royal duties until he recovers. She then shocks everyone with her first order, which is to strip the golden hero status as the kingdom's hero. Their nation is fighting for its life, and he has only shut himself in, so it's only right that he loses his status. They don't have enough mages to summon another hero, so the princess decides to consult with the oracle. We then see that the hero does not take the news well. He claims to be the chosen one and declares that they will beg him to come back when the Dark One attacks, but he just gets ignored. That night, Fleo points out that Reese has been doing so much and she declares that she would do anything for him. Fleo then tells her just how grateful he is to have her there. It must be hard for her to only be around humans all the time, so he thanks her, but she has fallen asleep. Fleo then thinks about how he was thrust into this world all alone. He credits Reese for helping him make it to the point where he has a home and he can get by. The next day, the girls encourage Fleo and Reese to go on a date. Fleo acts pretty shy about it, but the girls remind him that they are married. On the date, the two enjoy several activities. After a meal, Reese wants to make the best of the time they were given, so they go to the town market. Fleo offers to get her whatever she wants because she has been so helpful. Reese reveals that she has never been given a gift before, so she excitedly looks for something. Fleo picks out a brooch for her and he tells her that she looks beautiful. He gets embarrassed though and says that he was talking about the brooch. That night, the other girls wonder if something is wrong with Rees as she has been staring at the brooch for hours. It's a sign that their date went well and all the girls are jealous. Later that night, Fleo is shocked to wake up and find that Rees has made her way into his bed. They had a long day so he allows her to stay but he is sure he won't be able to sleep. Back at the castle, we see that the hero has broken into the treasury. He is furious about the princess stripping him of his role as hero, but he's glad to hear that Tsuya is still calling him hero. She is sure that he will return to the role one day, so she will continue serving him. He refuses to live as a commoner in this world, so he searches for something that will help him defeat the Dark One. He is the chosen hero, so if he can defeat the Dark One, then he can live the rest of his life as a champion. He thinks about how Fleo can use magic he can't, so he wishes he had more power. Just then, a voice declares that if he wants power, then he must set her free. The voice leads him to a secret room where she says that she will grant him any wish he may have after he draws a sword. The hero is shocked when Tsuya says that she can't hear the voice, and the voice antagonizes him into drawing the sword. She wonders if he is scared, but the hero is insulted by the question. He draws the sword and immense power bursts from the mantle. A spirit appears and she introduces herself as Hia. The hero was the one that freed her, so she offers to grant three of his wishes. She promises to grant anything he wants, so he gets a devious smile on his face as he prepares to ask for his first wish. Elsewhere in the castle, the princess meets with the oracle. She explains how dire the situation is as they need to come up with a solution before the effects of the purification spell wears off. Just then, their conversation is interrupted when strange collars appear on everyone's necks. The princess knows what this means, so she sends troops to the treasury to have the intruder apprehended. The oracle explains that the things around their necks are called the collars of sacrifice. There is a certain spirit that grants wishes, but places collars on her victims to remove their heads in exchange. Everyone is shocked as they can't believe that anyone would ever agree to that. 
The princess reveals that long ago, the king of Clyrode asked the spirit to defeat the Dark One. However, in exchange for granting this wish, it is said that half of all living things on the continent were sacrificed. Then, at the cost of many more sacrifices, all the mages in the kingdom combine their powers to seal this spirit away. Someone has broken the seal and asked the spirit for a wish. Everyone is terrified about their heads being removed, so the princess explains that they only have until the spirit grants the wish. The princess asks the oracle for a solution, so the old lady does her thing. She reveals that they must find the true hero, and this individual has actually already been summoned. Everyone realizes that this must be the adventurer that the king was trying to recruit as an ally. The oracle tells them where he can be found, but the princess does not want to divide their forces that are protecting the land just to go find him. Instead, she decides that she will go herself. Back with Leo, we see that he's trying to sell his dragon scale shield. The shop owner is impressed by it and remembers hearing a rumor that a huge amount of dragon meat was brought to the town butcher. Fleo doesn't reveal anything about the dragons, but does say that his materials came from the same source. The owner is excited to hear this and offers to pay whatever Fleo asks for the shield. In return, he would like for Fleo to bring him any other goods he gets from this source. Fleo agrees, but now he needs a good dealer that he can sell goods to that are made from magic beast hide. The owner is glad to help him, so he tells him about the other dealers. Boleros is amazed by Fleo, since he is clearly a man of many skills. Not only did he make a dragon shield, but he even secured a dealer and a steady route to sell more of them. Reese proudly explains that Fleo used to be a merchant, so Bellarosa envies her for having him as her husband. Reese doesn't like that kind of talk, so Bellarosa explains that she just wishes she had a man like him. Reese tries to make her feel better by pointing out that the Dark One likes her, but this doesn't help. Afterwards, Reese is glad to see Fleo accomplishing so much. However, him working more makes her a bit sad, since they will have less time to spend together. Rhys only has one request, so she asks that Fleo spend time with her when he has the chance. Fleo agrees to do so, but they are both shocked when Fleo's system warns that there is a spirit approaching. He appears before them, so Fleo wonders why she is looking for him. We then see that the hero wished for the spirit to end Fleo's life for humiliating him. The spirit wastes no time as she begins her attack in order to grant the hero his wish. Fleo's system activates its auto defense magic, but Reese jumps forward to protect Fleo. Fleo is then horrified as Reese ends up taking the attack head on. Reese begs for Fleo to run, and her brooch is shattered. He is disappointed after missing, so she attacks some more. Fleo's auto defense magic protects them, and he could only beg for Reese to be okay. He is impressed that he's able to block all her common offensive spells, so she prepares to use something more powerful. Reese is in really bad shape, so Fleo tries to use healing magic, but he is horrified when the spell gets cancelled. This is because Reese's injury is beyond the spell's capacity to heal. Unfortunately, there are no spells that can substitute for heal, so Fleo becomes upset when he sees the lifeless expression on Reese's face. Hia uses a spell called Origin of Light to deal massive damage, but she is once again impressed when they are unharmed. Just then, Fleo's system announces that he has acquired the Origin of Light and Darkness magic. Bellarosa is then shocked when she hears how furious Fleo is when he tells Hia that she will pay. Fleo has never been so angry as he swears that he will get revenge. Fleo thinks about how Reese was the one that believed in him and stayed by his side when he was thrown into this world all alone. She was so happy to act as his wife, and even when she was left all alone because of him, she still continued to love him. This made Fleo feel like protecting her in this new world was the role he had earned. Fleo has failed, so he once again vows to make Hia pay for what she has done. Just then, Hia is shocked as Fleo uses magic that turns back time. He uses it to reverse what happened to Reese, but this shouldn't be possible for a human. Her thought is interrupted as Fleo punches her right in the face and she becomes furious. She declares that she has mastered all of this world's magic, but Fleo couldn't care less. He stomps her into the ground and tells her to shut her mouth. Hia tries to attack with dark magic, but she is shocked when Fleo cancels it. She analyzes his power and is horrified when she sees that Fleo has infinite skills. In his rage, Fleo keeps punching her, and she realizes that defensive magic will do nothing against a god like him. Fleo continues his attack, and Reese wakes up amazed that she doesn't have a scratch on her. Bellarosa explains that Fleo saved her, and Reese is stunned when she sees her darling Fleo beating Hia relentlessly. 
She is flattered by how ruthless he is being for her sake, especially since physical attacks shouldn't work against a spirit that has mastered all types of magic. Her excitement ends, however, as she remembers how Fleo said he never wanted to hurt someone who already surrendered. His words were so kind, but now he has turned into some kind of vengeful monster. The all-powerful Hia now begs for her life, but Fleo refuses to stop as he reminds her that she killed Reese. Fleo prepares to take her life, but Reese stops him. She is grateful for him getting so upset over her, but she reminds him about not wanting to hurt someone that surrendered. He has always been so kind, and it would make her sad if he lost that because of her. Her words reach Fleo, and he calms down as she feels warm again. Reese tells him that she is just fine, and the two share a hug. Elsewhere, a mage gets exhausted after teleporting the princess. She apologizes for making him do it, since most of the mages still haven't recovered. The mage apologizes back, as he wasn't able to take the princess all the way to their destination. The princess declares that they must find the true hero at all costs, but they're all shocked when the collars of sacrifice disappear from their necks. Everyone is confused, and the princess wonders if this means that the spirit failed to grant the wish. Back at the castle, some guards prepare to barge into the treasury. Tsuya is terrified as she is sure that they will be executed. The golden-haired hero wonders if the spirit lied to him about his wish, but the voice from before begins to speak to him again. The voice takes control of Tsuya's body and changes her clothes. The golden-haired hero is kind of dumb, so he thinks that Tsuya somehow just learned to use magic. He is then of course shocked when the voice thanks him for freeing the spirit, because that is the only reason why she was able to get out. The hero is still confused, so the girl brings him to his knees and introduces herself as Damalinus, the Grand Magus of Midnight. The spirit has failed, but Damalinus promises to give him the power that he desires. It's not what he expected though, as he screams in agony, and Damalinus turns him into a monster. This monster terrorizes everyone as it makes its way through the castle, and Damalinus declares that she will get revenge on everyone who sealed her away. Just then, she notices that a teleportation circle was just used. Domelinus refuses to let the royals who sealed her get away, and this includes all of their descendants. Back with Fleo, he awakes up and begs for Fleo not to hurt her anymore. She is shocked to learn that Fleo healed her, but only because Reese ended up being okay in the end. They are unsure about what to do with the spirit though, as the knights of the castle aren't strong enough to deal with her, so the authorities in this town will have no chance. Fleo considers stealing her away in the treasury again, which makes Hia wonder how he knew about that. Fleo explains that he somehow gained more abilities and used one of them to read her mind. Hia realizes that this is projection magic, but she is horrified since she was the only one in the world that could use this magic before. Fleo fears that the same thing will happen again if they seal her away at the castle, so Ree suggests that they force Hia to become Fleo's servant. Reese interrupts Fleo when he tries to remind her that he doesn't want a servant, but she explains that this is the best way to keep an eye on her. Not to mention that having a powerful spirit on their side would be really helpful. Fleo gets really serious and wonders if this is okay with Reese, since he was the one that hurt her. Everyone gets worried as Reese screams, but she reveals that it's because she is frustrated. She blames herself for not being strong enough to withstand Hia's attack and still thinks it would be a good idea to make her their servant. Fleo is convinced so he agrees not to be mad at Hia forever and reaches out to her. As long as she promises never to hurt anyone again, Fleo offers to forgive her. Hia is shocked that she always believed that humans were the types of creatures to hold on to revenge forever. This revenge is what drives them to sacrifice others to achieve their goals. Fleo is clearly different, so she is intrigued. Hia calls Fleo the man who has made every power in existence his own, and she declares that she would like to see what he's able to achieve with it. She then declares that her body and all the power it holds now belongs to him. Fleo apologizes for beating her up, but she thinks about how it was really thrilling. Rhys becomes furious when she can tell that he is having some weird thoughts, but Fleo calms them down. Fleo thinks about using time reversing magic to clean the place up, but Hia asks him never to use that magic again. That magic requires precision, and if the user isn't able to narrow it down enough, there could be huge ramifications. That kind of magic isn't meant to be used by humans, so Fleo wonders why he's able to use it. This is when Hia reveals that Fleo is a supreme being, and his status shows that his skills are infinite. Everyone is shocked and Fleo realizes that this is what the symbol by his stats means. 
He explains that with infinite skills, Fleo is able to use a type of magic called Epiphany, which only those who have earned the title Transcendence can use. This means that once any type of magic is used on him, Fleo will acquire the spell and all spells associated with it. So when Hia used her magic on him, he gained the ability to use magic that only spirits could use. Fleo agrees not to use the time manipulation magic ever again and will use repair magic to fix the town instead. Later, Hia introduces herself to the others and declares that she will be a servant to the supreme being Fleo. Everyone is shocked so Fleo apologizes as he didn't know what else to do with her. The girls point out that he's talking about her like she's a stray cat and they wonder if it's really okay to live with the spirit. Bellarosa assures them that it will be fine as long as Fleo is there and she shows Hia to her room. That night, Fleo thinks about how he lost control and Bellarosa arrives to check on him. Hia told him that he has incredible power, but Fleo doesn't feel good about it since he has no clue how to use it. Bellarosa acknowledges that she doesn't have power like him, but she is confused about some things as well. Those she thought were allies turned out not to be, and those she considered enemies were not enemies at all. If it wasn't for meeting Fleo and Reese, she might still be wielding her sword for the wrong reasons. Because of this, she thanks Fleo. Later, Fleo can tell that something is bothering Reese, and she is hesitant to say anything. Out of nowhere, she just comes out and questions if Fleo intends to return to the world he came from. Now that he can use magic that spirits can use, she assumes that he will be able to teleport himself back to his old world. She begs Fleo to take her with him, as she doesn't want him to leave her behind. Fleo is touched by her words, and he assures her that he won't be going back. His old world would be a really tough place for her to live in, and he has no intention of leaving her behind to live there. Just then, Riz is shocked when Fleo asks if she would like to become his wife for real. He was scared out of his mind when he thought he lost her, and that is why he couldn't control himself. Riz is at a complete loss for words, and Fleo explains that he can't imagine life without Riz. Riz has never heard such kind words before, and she reveals that to her, she was his real wife from the very start. Her entire life, all she ever knew was fighting, but when she met Fleo, she learned that she could have all sorts of feelings. The two have never been closer, and they share a kiss. Reese points out that he no longer needs to hide his true appearance anymore, but Fleo has decided that this is who he is now. This is the person Reese knows, so his old self can just stay in the past. Just then, the two notice that he is in the room, and they are shocked to hear that she has been there since the moment they sat on the bed. He explains that she must see everything her supreme leader does, and she tells him not to be ashamed. Riz becomes furious, so Fleo has to hold her back, and the other girls listen to the chaos. Hia confidently comes up with a solution, and offers to turn invisible so they can keep doing what they were doing, but the couple refuses. Sometime later, we watch as the princess searches for the true hero. She refers to him as a person powerful enough to defeat many beasts at once on his own, but no one knows who she is talking about. Her search isn't going so well, so she wonders where Fleo could be. Back with Fleo, Reese explains that it's her job as the pack leader's wife to feed everyone. Hia helped her with the cooking, but Reese refused to let her use magic. Hia promises to do all the other chores as well, but the other girls become worried since taking their jobs will make them seem like deadbeat freeloaders. Fleo wishes Hia would stop calling him the Supreme One, but she doesn't understand and he notices that the other girls are uneasy. Outside, Blossom works really hard to make sure that she can't be replaced by Hia. Bellary is doing the same as she tends to the horses. Bellano thinks about how she failed her family by leaving the knights before she could become a castle mage like her father and brother. There is no need for her to try and get stronger, but Fleo is patient enough to teach her and he encourages her to keep getting better at magic. She doesn't want to let his help go to waste, so she is determined to learn all the spells she can. Just then, chaos breaks out as a magic beast appears to trample all over Blossom's crops. Bellano uses defensive magic to stop one of its attacks, and Bellarosa explains what happened. She couldn't bring herself to eliminate the beast because it seemed pretty calm, so she brought it home. Bellarosa now sees that it might be dangerous, so she prepares to end its life, but Bellary comes up with an idea. She instructs Saib to turn into his rabbit form, and she mounts the wild magic beast. Bellary manages to tame it, and everyone compliments her ability to control horses. Bellary gets an idea, and she wonders if they're allowed to use the vast open land surrounding the property. Bellarosa explains that it should be fine if Fleo buys the land, so Bellary can do what she is thinking. 
Later, Reese is glad to be spending time with Fleo alone, but he points out that it's not a date since they are just in town to sell equipment. That doesn't matter to Reese though because they're really married now and they can be as affectionate as they want. The merchant is impressed with what Fleo brought him and they agree to add some magical gems to it. Fleo admires the limestone and the merchant explains that it's pretty rare and worth a fortune. Outside, Reese admires how serious Fleo looks when he is working, but she is shocked when a shadow is cast over the town. The princess and her group are still searching for Fleo, but they are horrified when a monster appears in the sky. Reese informs Fleo as the town is breaking into chaos, and he determines that he must do something to protect the townspeople. The guards try to protect the princess, but Domelinus easily pushes the small fry back. Fleo is surprised to see Hia there, so she explains that she sensed waves of evil approaching. She then says that that monster is actually a human that was transformed by the witch Damalinus. Long ago, she ruled as the most powerful mage in the magical kingdom, but she sullied her hands with dark magic. She was defeated by the hero at that time, but even after her body died, her mind remained. He is partly responsible for the breaking of the seal, so she asked the Supreme Fleo for permission to eliminate Damalinus. Fleo allows it, but reminds her that the safety of the townspeople takes priority. Fleo and Reese will take care of that, so he is left to fight. Domelinus taunts the princess, as she only has one terrified soldier left to protect her. Domelinus loves how terrified the princess looks, and is sad that it will have to come to an end when she eliminates her. Domelinus goes in to end her life, but she is shocked when Hia appears out of nowhere to stop her. Domelinus is furious, so Hia explains that it's her duty to stop anyone that interferes with the Supreme One's life. Domelinus mocks Hia for failing to complete the wish, and she attacks, but Domelinus is shocked when she stops her with just one arm. Hia explains that no magic in this world can affect her, and someone of this world like Domelinus can't win. Domelinus decides to attack with her monster, but he is disappointed that she would resort to using brute force. Domelinus has more up her sleeve as she combines a magic attack with the monster, but Hia deflects them both. Domelinus is still confident that she won't lose, so she begins conjuring up another spell. This spell causes the monster to become even bigger, and the princess fears that it will harm more than just the city if it goes on a rampage. This giant beast starts stopping all over the city, but Domelinus is shocked when her spell is broken. Fleo arrives and reveals that he used release magic to stop the giant. Hia blames herself for him having to get involved, and she asks Fleo to punish her. Fleo says it's okay, so he would at least like to be allowed to finish off Domelinus herself. Domelinus is still in shock from her spell being destroyed by a mere human, and Hia uses this moment to remove Domelinus from Suya's body. Hia then seals her away by eating her orb. She is sealed away in Hia's mental scape, so Hia declares that she will punish Domelinus and force her to use her powers to serve Fleo. Just then, Princess Elizabeth introduces herself to Fleo and thanks him for saving the kingdom. She apologizes for how he was treated and explains that the golden hero was recently relieved of his duties. Elizabeth asks him to return to the kingdom with her as the true hero so he can restore the hope of the people. Fleo declines and he recommends that she give the job to someone who won't hesitate to wield their power for humanity's sake. Fleo is happy with his life and his only wish is to live in peace with his wife. When they return home, Fleo is shocked when the girls ask him if they can expand their property. This would give Blossom more room for farmland and Blurry more space so she can catch and raise horse magic beasts. The horses will draw a cart full of vegetables for them to sell and Fleo wouldn't have to work at all. Reese fears that powerful magic beasts won't listen to a human, but Blurry is confident that they will be peaceful if they have a lot of land to roam around in. The best part is that the girls even offer to do all the negotiating to buy the land themselves. However, Fleo gives the girls an estimate on how much the land will cost and they are shocked. The girls think about selling their things, but Fleo offers to pay for it himself. It will be part of the household anyway and Fleo instructs them to just give him 30% of their profits as rent. The girls are extremely happy with this, so they get right to work. Fleo gets an idea and suggests that Blossom try raising some crops that are more difficult to grow. He offers to use temperature control magic to achieve this, but Blossom says that the entire reason she started her farm was so that she wouldn't be a freeloader by being overly dependent on Fleo. Hia offers to use her magic instead, but Blossom has a problem with the idea in general. She thinks that plants need love and sunlight to grow and not everything could be done with magic. 
He points out that her magic would make the farming more efficient, and Bellano appears out of nowhere to say that she would like to see what Hia can do. The others notice that Bellano is dressed differently, so she explains that she has decided to go to the College of Magic and she was on her way to training. Bellano intended to just go as a student, but the college said that they would even be willing to accept her as a teacher. Everyone is amazed and she credits Fleo for teaching her. Fleo reminds her that she did all the hard work and she thanks him. She has learned that magic can be used for a lot more than attacking, so she wonders if Blossom has changed her mind. Blossom gives in to the pressure and agrees to let Hia use her magic on just one part of her farm. Afterwards, Fleo and Reese admire how everyone has found something they wanted to do. Fleo has as well and reveals that one day he would like to open his own shop in this world. Reese is sure that it will be great and even offers to recommend his shop to all her friends. Fleo points out that her friends are all demons, but she assures him that they will go into human form first. Reese reminds him that she would do anything for him, and Fleo reveals that he made a ring for her out of a really pretty stone. Reese is shocked when he explains that it's a wedding ring, and he has one to match. The two share a nice moment, and Reese couldn't be happier. At the castle, we see that the golden-haired hero and Suya have been imprisoned. Suya is sure that they will be executed, and the hero vows to get his revenge. Thanks for watching my recap. Subscribe to the channel to help us make the push to 700,000 subscribers.